Welcome to The Friday Habit with Mark Labriola and Benjamin Manley. The Friday Habit is for small business owners, freelancers, and creatives who are ready to take their business to the next level. Join us as we discover how to apply the strategies we learn to grow our businesses, make more money, and live every day like it's Friday. And welcome back to another Friday Habit. How you doing, Ben? And I'm doing good, testing out a new microphone. I sound all right? Yeah, you sound great, dude. All right. You know? I mean, not um, as good as you, but that's just, well, you, know, you know, what can be... Ex- I, you're not an... Can't a, compete a, with those <laughs> smooth tones, you know? <laughs> exactly. And he's today we got great. Jeremy Laceris on the podcast today. You know, he's a serial entrepreneur, investor, and former global marketing and communications executive. So the big dog at the top. Uh, over the past two decades, Jeremy has founded and led eight of his companies to successful exits. And Jeremy is currently the founder and CEO of Payment Brokers, a fintech company focused on AI-enabled cost reductions. So, Jeremy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, man. Um, all right. So, question of the day is give me three TV shows that you watched from, you know, maybe in your teens and then I'm, I want to hear like, what, what are we hearing? Like in your twenties and then your thirties, like give me three wow. this shows. Is the worst. This is the worst. <laughs> I didn't watch TV at all. You're like, I was busy <laughs> building companies. <laughs> I didn't, I'm not kidding. I didn't turn the TV on. People are like, Oh, you didn't see that show. I just never watched TV. Okay. I, Even as a kid, guilty, I mean, what did you do? You okay, woke I mean, up, I mean, your like, parents were sleeping and they're like, make a bowl of cereal. You just like stared out the window and watched the leaves blowing in yeah, the wind. I think this is like an only child thing. I like picked, <laughs> I started, this is a true story. I would just pick up like building blocks and start MacGyvering my way okay. through. So maybe, maybe that was a show I watched when I was really young, not to put age on me, but, um, of course I liked top gear at some point okay. in my life. Yeah. So I was a ge- little bit of a gearhead for a while. So I would try to catch up and download one of those once in a while. Yeah. That's about the extent of my TV. I, I think Ben's <laughs> probably close in, in that realm. He was the kid who was like out there boy scouting in the wilderness, like building right. forts and stuff. He wasn't yeah. watching Scooby-Doo or He-Man. No, no. That was <laughs> off right. limits. Maybe maybe watching a few. Uh, let's see. What were the um, Sound of Music? I mean, Thundercats. Uh, Sound of Music. You know, I, I have that movie <laughs> kind of memorized. Are alive. Uh, Bambi was a big one. Uh, okay. I've seen that lots of times. So Disney classics. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Those weren't off limits. Yeah, my dad was really strict, especially with TV as a kid. So I, I really wasn't allowed. Sometimes my sister and I would sneak this show called, uh, it was like on Fridays, like TGI Fridays. And it was like Steve oh, yeah. Urkel and, and yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. And so um, we would do that. And then really it wasn't until I left home. It was still pretty busy. I don't really remember. Like I had friends who watched Dawson's Creek and things like that. But I remember one of the ones that really stands out to me is Lost, the TV show, because I remember it was like really popular uh, and everyone's like, oh, do you watch Lost? And um, my wife and I had just been married for like a year. So it was like 20 years ago. And I was like, no, no, you know, I never, never seen it, whatever. Well, this was like right when iTunes was kind of new and you could download, ep- you know, Binge watch it all at once. Well, no, well, kind of. It was kind of there, but what we did is we 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 bought the pilot episodes and we're like laying in bed, like on my little like PowerBook twelve inch, you know, Mac computer, and and we watched the first pilot episode. I don't know if you've ever seen Lost, but it's like the pilot episode is like really chaotic. You know, there's the plane crash, things are on fire, people are all disoriented, and so we watched the pilot episode and we're like sitting in bed. It was like maybe like nine o'clock at night, and after it was over, we like looked at each other and was like. This is awesome. And I like, put on my shoes and I ran to Walmart and bought the, bought the DVD box set, you know, cause it was, it was already out. It was, it was old awesome. news to most everybody else. But for me, it was like brand new. And I was like, this is great. And then how disappointed were you? <laughs> well, by, by, by after season three, it started really going downhill and it was just <laughs> kind of lame. And I was like bummed that it turned out to be such a, um, I don't they know. They never I guess they never answered any of the questions of like what all this Yeah, like it was like are like they dead? Are they yeah. in some sort of purgatory in between, you know, <laughs> life and death? It got kind of they were trying too hard. I, I wish they would have just maybe ended it after four seasons, like on a real high note and 
maybe some interdimensional beings or something like that would I don't this know. is why I can't watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll watch a movie. So that that is our binge. We'll watch movie. Like if a new movie comes out, yeah. I have to. I, we'll get on and watch that once in a great while. But I just never had time for it. Jeremy, you're that classic entrepreneur, high achiever. That's like, yeah, man. I just drink green uh, green juice and and work out every day. Get up at four a.m. and <laughs> run my <That's>... businesses. <laughs> That I did all of the above. <laughs> I think I'm. I'm. This no exaggeration. I'm actually on a Netflix documentary for drinking green juice. <laughs> no way. I no swear way. my life. I didn't even know that it ended up that they spun the whole thing about you know people being idiots and spending all this money on things that aren't really proven. And um, that's not what they told me when I recorded like that. Oh really? That video. I'm not kidding. That actually happened. My my wife. You know, I guess one of her friends saw me on the Netflix. I had done this two years previous. Okay. So I was on this, like, you know, health, try to just be focused and work and like, yeah. you know, grinding out 28 hours a day, nine days a week. Biohacking. I was big time into biohacking, literally everything I could do to continue to move forward. Right. Um, except being healthy. Like it is the most unhealthy. <laughs> it, it's entrepreneurial seizures is what I used to call them. You'd be, I'd be like, Oh, I, I have to do this. And I would stop everything and go do it. And yeah. So m my wife tells me, uh, are you in a Netflix documentary? And I was like, pa like panic stricken about what? <laughs> You're like, like what or, is it? The Epstein Isle? Like, I, I what's going what, on? I'm like, <laughs> there's definitely camera phones. I don't know what I did, but I'd like to know before I say anything. And then next thing you know, she's, it, it's a, a friend of mine owned a juice place in Chicago. I, I grew up there and I had done a 30 day, no food, just green juice fast. And it changed me. And I, I did another one. And, and then the juice, the guy that owned the store was like, Hey, there's this company that's coming here to do a video. I'd love to have you in it. You're my biggest customer. <laughs> can you, can you come in and do an interview? And I was like, yeah, sure. And the guy was, they were super nice and whatever, but it turns out like they tried to spin it and, yeah. <laughs> so then what was the spin? What was it like? The spin was like, none of this is medically proven. You're an idiot if you're spending money on like alternatives. <laughs> Look at all these morons like this guy uh, here who buys $500 a week on like juice. And, down I, the and I did an hour interview and they used like one clip. Uh, I spend like $500 a week. They're like, Look at this moron yeah, who spends it. all this money. I, <laughs> we got I was it. Like, Thanks, man. Oh man, I bet that's exactly how. I don't know if you ever saw, but I think Vice did a whole documentary on uh, the flat Earth uh, movement and the flat Earth community. And I'm thinking, like, how did they agree to be filmed? Because it's like, did they not think this was going to be spun into just yeah. the most ridiculous thing ever? Is <laughs> I'm sure it's just like spin, that. They spin the sales pitch <laughs> to get you on. And then exactly. you're yeah, on and sure. you sign a document. You're like, yeah, I want to help my buddy out. Like I want him to get the promotion. There you are forever. Yeah. Well, you need to, you need to, uh, you know, push into that. I need to find that now. I'm going to clip it. <laughs> I'm going to, I'll find the name at the end of this. Yeah. <laughs> send it to you guys. Uh, so are you still on the dream, uh, green juice kick? Yeah, I mean, I take AG1, right? Oh, okay. Just something in the morning. I'm not doing the full-on juice cleanses like I used to. I mean, I do it once in a while. It's a reset button. Yeah. But um, I'm, I, I got big into, I don't I don't know if I'd call it biohacking, but I got into doing any alternative to traditional just to try something different. I grew up in it. Um, my sister, who's been a naturopath for a long time, really indoctrinated me into alternatives. And it's been great. Yeah. It's been a great addition to like traditional everything else that I do. So it's, it's, um, it's been helpful to maintain while I used to burn to build the companies. Yeah. So it, I don't know that I would have survived it elsewise. Well, that's, that's good. So there's, there's some positive that came from it. Yeah. What's your favorite combo? Are we going like kale and apple and <laughs> I hate it. And you know, what's really funny. I'm a meat and potatoes person. <laughs> nice. So I don't, if you put vegetables on a plate, I'm like, I mean, yeah. So I'll eat the protein. I'll eat around it and make it look like I move some of it yeah. into a corner somewhere. Um, yeah, I don't really have a favorite. They're all pretty gross still, even to this day. <laughs> <laughs> but five hundred bucks a week. I mean, you know, <laughs> it, it. Listen, after the third day, it was a. I had, I was getting worse and worse, and it was getting to a point like headaches, and it was really gruesome tiresome yeah but after day three it was like something snapped mm -hmm. and i had the most energy i'd ever had and i was very 
clear on what I was doing and any type of distraction was out of the way. Cause I wasn't like, Oh, when's the next meal? I got to get prep mm-hmm. and this. And I was just head down work. So it, it definitely worked. Um, I also dropped a ton of weight. That was a nice side effect, yeah. which I could use because I was traveling and eating, eating like crap. Yeah. Like the worst <laughs> of the worst. And I was also like working for a huge company, uh, entertaining executives going out to like oh, yeah. fancy dinners, it's like every whiskey night. and steak every night. Every, <laughs> you got to wake up early. I was like, lobster and steak <laughs> and red wine and red and whiskey and a shot. And by the time uh, you're done, you're, I'm like, how did I? What happened? Seriously, that is <laughs> catches brutal. up to you. Oh yeah, I have a buddy who's in sales, and it just sounds exhausting. You know, he's like, and it's like not even fun after a while because it's like I think when you're young and single and whatever, but then it's like you have family and kids. You're like. I'd rather be at home with them than trying to entertain these people and buy them all this expensive yeah. food. Yeah, we I've seen some I've turned in some pretty healthy expense reports. Oh, I can only imagine. Sure. I remember going to dinner <laughs> once. It was like me and like two other people uh in Vegas and we went to this place called uh Sushi Samba in the Venetian. Yep. And it was like for the three of us it was like fifteen hundred bucks. Like <laughs> It's like, I'm like, hopefully the uh, expense department doesn't call. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we were spending that on bottles of wine. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So exactly. Like, <laughs> You're getting it, like a $5,000 dinner bill and it's like, all right, well. <laughs> yeah. Jeremy's got it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you, so you grew up in Chicago, the Windy City, kind of close to the city or outside the city? Both. So I, I grew up downtown, South Side. Oh, gangster. Um, yeah. I grew up in, I wouldn't call it the hood but it was adjacent hood adjacent (laughs) yeah maybe that's a good word for it um and then as i got smarter and had a little bit of money in my pocket i started moving north i moved out when i was really young i was 15 so it was just trying to it was a survivalist thing so as i had a little step up i would move further north and west yeah and i ended up in a, a small city called lake in the hills illinois it's in the middle of nowhere Um, but it was great. I mean, it was a good life and got myself further and further away from the city. And then I moved, you know, I was like, what am I doing? I moved back downtown (laughs) and ended up just off of Michigan Avenue. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. So you said you left the home at 15. Um, did you move out and live on your own or did you live with a grandma or like an aunt or something like that? I moved out and lived on my own. It was, uh, it was a weird, weird time. My parents had separated when I was really young and, we were living in poverty for, for the most part. One of my parents was doing mediocre and the other one was like living in a car. Right. Mm. So I was kind of in between and, and my, uh, my mother who moved to Kentucky, they're like, we're moving on an 88 acre farm. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going. Yeah. And they're like, the alternative was like, you can live in a car. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll find an apartment. And they just didn't believe that I could pull it off. And they were like, how are you going to get, who's going to sign for you? Who's going to, yeah. how are you going to do this? So I, I, I pulled it off. You're like, and, catch me uh, if you can. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that was the beginning phases. Right. And so I moved out and made it work and never turned back. Wow. So then you were taking care of yourself and living on your own, like going to the grocery store and yeah, driving I mean, yourself to school and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, for a short period of time, I ended up dropping out of high school cause I just couldn't, I couldn't do everything. Yeah. Uh, I work a full-time job, pay everything, yeah, make it work. Plus it was not a great neighborhood and I was a, definitely a target for them. Yeah. So it was not really a great. You um, lived in fear. It was, it was significant. I mean, it was, I think I, I've said this on other podcasts more recently, just, it was a survivalist mentality back then. Mm-hmm. Like just make it through, get, get to the next phase get to tomorrow. Um, and so that, that's how it was back then. And then as I had tiny bits of success, I was able to just slowly migrate myself out of all of that mess. And it it was really fortunate that I did as fast as I did. Yeah. And I had, I had friends that were helpful and I had family that wanted to help. I just wanted to do it myself. Hmm. What, what were some of the first things you did for work and, and then what was the, like the progression of, it was rapid progression. So I was always a serial entrepreneur. It, it start that started really young. I was indoctrinated by my my parents early on to start something and build something. And I did, you know, I had had a. There's a article on my website about my lemonade stand when I was six that mm-hmm. grossed three thousand dollars. Blah blah blah. So that was like the first. Hey, you can do this. And and I got ads and ends jobs, um, really really young. 
but then I always had a side hustle and that really broke through quickly. And then I got a good career in sales as a sales trainer for a window and siding company. And then from that, it just springboarded. Like my income just went wild. And just I was selling still windows? Building. Yeah. So there was, a, there was a company in Mount Prospect, Illinois. Uh, they sold windows and siding. And I was really young and applied to be the sales trainer. Mm. And the guy was like, no, <laughs> you're like, 16, like, there's no way you're going to be the sales trainer. I said, I could outsell anybody here because I, I was a hustler. Like I grew up yeah. trying to make it work. It's a street I was like, smarts. I can figure this out. Yeah. Yeah. So he said, let's take you out to a, a sale. And if you sell this deal, you can be a sales trainer. And I closed a $20,000 window and siding job. And I think it was one, my age and innocence that closed that deal more than my sales mm -hmm. skills. <laughs> but he's like, I'll give you a shot. And I ended up being their sales trainer and training, you know, 40 year old guys that were going out and selling were listening to my advice on how to sell. And I went through Xerox sales training and I went through, I went through all of the, you know, the big sales trainings that they were affording me the mm -hmm. opportunity to learn. I took every bit of that and used every ounce that I could to continue on that. And so while I did that, I was building companies on the side. So I had a full-time gig and I would come home and close my door I get on a computer and I built a an online furniture retailer. That was one of my first companies that I had a lot of success with. What so I, online furniture retail? One is it's like two thousand one too. Yeah, was, it's like Amazon's before, not around. Yeah, so yeah. what what eBay was? Oh yeah, eBay was that was it was still the king. It was like MySpace and eBay. <laughs> yeah. But and I, what what was it like? Okay, you had where did that idea come from? As far as like doing a, a digital business or e-commerce or whatever that might be, where did that come from? And then why did you choose furniture? I didn't really, I was going to say furniture chose me. Um, <laughs> you know, I didn't really choose furniture. I, somebody was telling me, Hey, you know, I work at a furniture wholesaler. We import stuff from China. Just so happened to be in the same neighborhood where I worked. And the guy's like, I'm going to show you. Like, so I ended up going and seeing it. And I'm like, you can buy a whole, house of furniture for a thousand bucks. Like there's no way. And he's, yeah, we import it from China. I mean, it was all like yeah. pine wood, balsam wood, like furniture with, you know, pleather, which they now call vegan leather. Great marketing ploy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was like, I had, this is a business in a box. I can sell this. Mm. So I put a couple pieces on eBay. I bought it, put it, put it in like a garage sold it. And I was like, great, let me put up a page. Why am I paying eBay 25% of my sale? And that thing took off. Wow. And at first it was friends and family. Like I was cutting up catalogs and taking their name up. Like I did whatever I had to do to, yeah. to make wow. a side buck. And then it turned into a real thing where I, at that time had a nice apartment and they rented garages. So I was like, well, I'll rent a garage. So I started putting furniture in there and then I rented a second, a third, a fourth, fifth. And then they finally said, Hey, you can't have... <laughs> <laughs> semi trucks delivering furniture every week coming in and out of the apartment community. We got to shut this down. And, um, huge problem with credit card processing because people were charging stuff back. Mm. They had like a little nick in the furniture and it was like, just not, I mean, it was Chinese furniture, nothing yeah. against it, but it just wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. quality. Right. And it took off and it did well, but then I had tons of returns and people returning stuff mm. And they were charging it back on their credit card. So I'm like, I'll take the return because I don't, I can't, you, you couldn't fight the charge back. Right. And um, they just piled up on me. And I was like, what am I going to do? And I got really fortunate that this local retailer was threatened to death by me. So they bought the company. Wow. I just, just super lucky, man. It wasn't, it wasn't because I thought I was the king and that I was doing really well. Right. They just wanted, they wanted nothing to do with it. They were buying from the same company. Mm. They're pretty well known name in furniture in Chicago. And they didn't and they want were just the worried, competition. They were, we were, I was running on 10 points of margin and they were probably running on 300. Wow. But it was like what they didn't know of what, was the fear of it. Right. And then it's like, man, if they would have waited two I more mean, months, you would have just blown up and you were, you know, I was upside down. I right. had a whole, I was like, what am I going to do? I have garages. I'm paying $500 a month for, you know, furniture that is, you know, somewhat damaged somewhere. I'm right. like scratch and dent. I still can't. Right. Like the, the, the cost of carrying was more than what I could have sold the furniture for. Mm. So there was a point where I was like dumpsters 
and the dumpsters cost money. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can't, couldn't wow. win. But you so essentially had a good really brand, early. though. Yeah, Cle- furniturestock.com. Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly, you know, if someone was going to buy you, right, it would it it would be the the whatever impression that they had of you made them afraid that you were like growing and you were big and that you could so bad. Yeah. Go to the way, do you know what the way yeah, back yeah, machine oh, yeah. is, right? The NNR, go look at this website. You will die. <laughs> it's the worst website ever, but it worked. It, it was successful. I mean, and I was leveraging eBay sales to drive people to my site, right? It was like buy something small on eBay and then I could push them over and I'd make 25 points of margin more. And it mm-hmm. was great. It was a good business, yeah. Um, but I'd never do it again. <laughs> All right. So when they bought that first company, um, oh, I thought it was a king. Yeah, and so then your was it a decent buyout? I mean, did you? Yeah, it, it was okay. You know? it wasn't. It it wasn't going to change my life, but it definitely started the mentality of what an exit was all about, right? And the fact that you could fast forward time and profitability by exiting. You know, Ben's shaking. He says he's like what was the multiple um <laughs> 2x and it was barely 2x i mean it was like just stop doing this mm. x yeah and i was happy i would have taken one i didn't know i didn't know what i didn't know i didn't have a right. coach i didn't have you know mentorship or people helping me this was just me trying to figure it out and, and how old were you er- at this point um you're gonna make me do math yeah like 17 uh, 18 two, or something like yeah okay. 2001 yeah. i don't remember how old it was. <laughs> <laughs> i don't even know how old i am now <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, So, yeah, it was uh, definitely like just the best experience ever because now I'm like, I'm an e commerce guy. Yeah. No, I'm not. (laughs) I was putting PayPal, you know, embedding PayPal, you know, buy it now buttons on a HTML page using Dreamweaver. Come on. Like, I was (laughs) Dreamweaver. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, That's awesome. But you learn, you learn quick. And that was the first one. And then it just spiraled from there. It was. So, uh, did you start uh, looking for like, at that point, okay, that business is bought. Now, did you start thinking, okay, what are some other profitable businesses or no? Nope. Or okay, you just <laughs> I had a million. I still to this day. So my team, including my wife and friends, they're like, stop, no more businesses. <laughs> I have so many things I have to get off my chest. So I've I've kind of found it therapeutic now to just write it out. And I mean, these are detailed write-ups. I, if I open this notepad and show it, you'd be like, whoa, what? There's pages and pages and pages of things I have to get off my chest. Like, this needs to be done. And you guys probably do this too, mentally. You look at some angle of something or something that's missing, or you're like, why doesn't that exist? Yeah. And you search it and you're like, it's not there. Mm-hmm. I immediately start yeah, pulling puzzle pieces together. Like, I can do that. That was this and this and make this happen. And I, I was fortunate to have later on in my career, I ended up working for a big engine manufacturing company and the founder of that company took me under his wing and really just let me be me. Mm. Let me be an entrepreneur, uh, introduce me to people, help me with putting more puzzle pieces together, pulled me into other businesses they were involved in. And I was a partner in building a tech system that is now a standard product on every marine application is a company called zero off Mm. it's a gps speed control for the marine industry and i watched not necessarily from the sidelines but just i watched them pull these resources together and they just said figure it out Mm. handed it to me and said go like let's let's build this and now you know another exit that i had that was just it was awesome it was awesome to build it and get it incorporated into everything had major OEMs actually adopt the product. So I got to learn from my experiences. And then as I, as my career progressed, I got really amazing people around me that helped further all of the things I could do or the connections I could make to make something happen faster. And um, that became my success for the rest of the exits. And, and so then at that point, did you start thinking that the exit was going to be, the the strategy like build something to sell it no that so i just thought all of these things were going to be billion dollar companies right i just never sat down and planned i was more of a pull the trigger and then point later yeah and so and i still do this but now i have a bit more foresight and planning experience i don't like analysis paralysis i'm just yeah. like just do it that's how just i am. jump in and you're gonna you're gonna figure it out right that that was my 
concept early on. And I always thought these things are going to be huge and it's going to do extremely well. I never thought, hey, you're going to have to sell it and exit. But there was a point where I realized I wasn't a good operator. Mm -hmm. I'm a great idea, ideator, builder, connector, um, thought process and profitability mentor. Like, let's get it to bottom line. I was a bottom line builder too. I didn't care about revenue ever. Mm -hmm. I just wanted it to be sustainable because I was always bootstrapped. Yeah. I didn't raise capital. I wasn't out there trying to get loans. I wasn't, you know, doing these credit card hacks for money. Like I was literally taking every dollar I had and putting them into these companies. So it was profit first. Like I want to mm -hmm. get paid. Yeah. And so with that kind of mentality, I didn't think about exit. And then when I learned I wasn't a great operator because I would just get bored and I want to build the next thing, I was like, exit. And somebody's like, you're going to get 10X on this. And I was like, whoa, hold on. What? What? Then it became more lifestyle alignment. And I think as I had some exits, I went from that scarcity survivalist mentality mm -hmm. to like, harmony of how does this fit into the puzzle piece of the life I want to live? Mm -hmm. And I think it became more focused on how is that going to work for what I want to live like? And so I stopped building things to operate and started building them to sell. So it took, it, it was, that was a gradual thing. It wasn't like, Hey, let's go do this. And I don't want to make it sound like I don't want to operate the companies that I build. I just think there's people that are better. Yeah. At it's like really like finding your strong suit. I mean, I, I think a lot of people can relate to that. It, a lot of times, especially creatives or freelancers, you know, they, they start doing a thing because they're good at it. Right. Or they're passionate about design or art or whatever it might be. And then they start getting jobs like, Hey, can you make this PDF? Can you design my brand? Can you, and so they start doing all those things. And then they start growing something and then they have to hire on people. And then they're put in this position where it's like, man, I really just wanted to do art and create, but now I have to worry yeah, about payroll. And I, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it becomes very uh, complicated. And then your life gets wrapped up in it. Your identity gets wrapped up into it. And uh, it makes it difficult to to move on. And then I, I guess one thought is, is how do you make that leap from starting something, building it to be big enough in order for you to bring somebody in to then operate it? I mean, every deal is different, right? So I think you have to find the pain threshold that makes sense. I still think every entrepreneur should go through the full cycle of pain, run every part, get involved in every mm -hmm. facet of the business, understand it well enough that you can do it yourself. And then you can start to bet when you have a little bit of success, you can start to back off a little bit. But I think what ends up happening is people think they can do what I just talked about that I do today, day one, you can't do that. Right? They're, they're not educated enough to understand what it actually takes to run it and manage it. And they'll bleed the company dry. And they often do like people immediately, like I need a person to do this and a person to do that and a person to do this. I'm like, I think you're going to do that yourself for a while. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I, and I hate, I like, I hated shipping stuff. I was always like, Oh man, I got to go pack orders and ship them. I had a company called alternative healthcare and we were selling, you know, supplements to B2B, uh, and like basically vendor manage inventory, breaking case packs and selling them to small mom and pop, you know, mm -hmm. grocery. And that was a great business, but it was brutal. I mean, I would come home from work and at the time I was, you know, working for an engine manufacturing company. I was a vice president of marketing and communications. It was a real gig yeah. with a lot of work and I would come home and I would be up till 1am packing and shipping orders. Like, and yeah. why did you do that? I mean, because I'm assuming if you're a VP of I marketing communication, money. you were making a good living. This wasn't about money. I think I have this sickness of, <laughs> like, it's a it's a real problem. <laughs> I, I actually want to build stuff. Yeah. And then I'm like, I, I, I don't know if I like the pain that much that I'm just like, let's just do that again. Uh -huh. But I do. Interesting. I mean, uh, I kind of identify with you a little bit. I don't know, Mark, if you were thinking this or not, but I feel like I'm similar in some ways. And I'm curious about some of the things you write down because I feel like I get these ideas and I'm like, I want this to exist in the world. Like, this is such a good idea. It needs to happen. And it's like, it's like you're creating a living thing. It's like, okay, there's these different parts and you're like, okay, I want this thing to work this way, this part. And you can see it all in your head. So you're like, I can see it. Like, I just want it to exist now. 
And it's like, I get yeah. impatient. I'm like, why is it not already here? You know, I want to give it away. I don't even care if yeah. I don't even want to do it myself. Best. I'm like, just do just, if somebody, I, there's a part of me that wants to create a, a, a blog just to just fire it out there and be like, guys, pay attention. Cause these are real ideas that have serious dollars right. attached to them. Mm-hmm. But then part of me is like, yeah, but I want to do that. <laughs> yeah, like, I want to do all of these. Sick. Do you, What's wrong with you? Do you, uh, do you try to leverage your ideas in a way where like, Hey, from the beginning, I can have somebody else do this. Or are you like, no, I need to go through that so that I can really get a handle on it and not just like, Oh, you manage this one. You manage this idea. Like what, what's your thought on that? My thought was you're going to hate this because now you're going to be like, that's what we should do. <laughs> um, I built an agency because I wanted to spin these ideas out and have, I heard a story. I've never confirmed this story, but I heard a story that Bill Gates was at a round table with a bunch of people and he came in and went, had, he had an entrepreneurial seizure and he said, how many cars are sold? And somebody was like, and I don't know if this is a true story. So please feel free to delete this (laughs) if it's not true, but I've heard this story somewhere. He sat at a table and said, how many cars are sold? And one of the guys at the table was like, I don't know. He's like, you're fired. How many cars were sold in the U.S.? And somebody said X amount of million. And he's like, great. I want to make $25 on every car sold. And and that's how Carfax was born because he had a bunch of smart people around him that were like, how do we do this? And what are the angles and how many connection points? And then they have a branding team. They have a development team. They have a... So I, I had originally created Original Click which is actually a group of friends of mine, but Hmm. original click was supposed to be my ideation incubator. Hmm. And it was supposed to be the original spark of idea. And then I have all these people to execute. And then that company turned into a company called designed.co, which I recently sold in December, which was a, a big agency that was focused on all sorts of creative aspects because I had this agency and it wasn't really monetized. It was just for my own internal use. And I was like, what if I monetize it? Then Mm. I can spin my ideas out even faster. (laughs) And yeah, I use the agency to death for my own personal, like, hey, let's build this. Hey, I have this idea. So I was hoping to create a team that I could tap on to say, hey, new idea, guys. This is it. Marcom, you know, developer, this, that, like plug in all the pieces and like come back to me with an MVP and we can put it to to work. And so we've done that. We've, we, in effect, I have the team today to do that, but I'm very, now I'm a, a bit more selective and also way more protective of my time than I used to be. And just the balance of how does that fit into my lifestyle? Sure. And there's a lot of these businesses that I, like I have a restaurant idea. I'm never going to run a restaurant <laughs> right, ever. Right. It'll never happen, but I still want to do it. Right. <laughs> Totally. Like, so I want to, I want to tell people the idea and give it away, but also I, at the same time, like this is a, it's a billion dollar idea. <laughs> I think it would change the restaurant industry overnight. I think every company would adopt it. You'd have a, a version or variant of that same, you know, system in every restaurant. Just don't, I have no more minutes left in my day. So right. what I would, what I have been coached to do is write it down, get it all out of your system, put all the little things that you want in dents and, you know, bullet points of what you, how you think it would operate and just get it off your chest and go back to doing what you're doing. That's, <laughs> so, that's awesome. What do you, what do you, it's uh, helpful. what's your um, process when it comes to getting that stuff out of your head? What do you usually think about first? Do you think about profitability? Do you think about operations? Do you think about customer experience Sales. or everything at once? Like how, how does it come together in your head? Can, is somebody going to write me a check to do the first one? I, I actually don't care. Like all the operational stuff and efficiencies and like how does it function? I I am the king of sell something before you got it. Mm-hmm. And then if you have customers lined up, even if you say, hey, it's not ready yet, it's in beta. It's so easy to build something when the customers are ready. Mm-hmm. It's so hard to build, like come it, bring, you know, build it and they will come. That was never my business. Yeah. Because it was like I and I had I've done that and it wasn't successful. You know, I, I've had eight exits. Maybe four of them were successful exits. Four of them were necessity exits. You know, whether it was like I, I couldn't continue to manage it or I couldn't scale it past a certain point or it just wasn't profitable enough for me to manage. Right. So 
there's probably 20 other companies I'm not even mentioning that went, that I put some level of time, effort, or energy or money into and went nowhere. Mm. So I think I've learned earlier, uh, at least, you know, through trial and error that there is no perfect science to any of this other than if you have sales, you can build something. Yeah. Do you, you know? did you have like a, a nice looking PowerPoint presentation? Always. And and, and then you would go in Very somewhere and you focused. didn't even have an actual product or anything. And you're like, Hey, yeah. Here's often. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but isn't that, isn't that Kickstarter today? Yeah, no, that's I mean, true. Isn't that, yeah. So, I mean, I, I look at, I mean, isn't that every pitch, everybody, like you get this hockey stick, you know, uh, presentation from some startup and they're like, this is our sales. It's like, do you really have a path to that? It would be different if you were going to use that pitch to go sell customers, but they don't, they go raise capital mm -hmm. and then they give away the farm. And most people don't have a huge document with a hundred other ideas behind them. They have one. And so it's a, it's always been a fear and it, it's been kind of a quest for me to find out and help those types of entrepreneurs who are like, they got all eggs in one basket. And the first thing they think to do is go raise capital. It's not a great idea. Mm -hmm. They end up giving away their company or they sign up for something they're not ready to prepared for when they could just bootstrap their way to the first bits of revenue. So I love early stage. I love bootstrap founders. I think it's a very rare thing to be able to get to revenue and profitability before you go raise capital. And then it's easy to raise money. Right. Very rare that company's like, we're profitable. What? <laughs> I mean, so right. it's so much easier. And so I think that was just for me. Don't get me wrong. I think there's businesses that need capital day one. You're not going to say, oh, I built AI, you know, in my basement right. um, with no capital and no, no one gave me money. I just built it. There were probably iterations in the beginning, but to get to where, you know, open AI or some of these companies are, they, it takes huge money. So I understand those, but for the, you know, 99% of the rest of the businesses, they just don't need it. So it, it's a bootstrap environment that I think really fosters really great beginnings to companies. Yeah. What happens after that is, you know, it's a crap shot. It really depends on the founder and how they operate and, you know, you're, I like in the investments I make, I invest in people. So it's, you know, it's really about how hungry is that investor to act or founder to actually take it all the way through to the end right. and what is their tolerance for pain? Because it's not easy. Yeah. What's your, um, so you talked about kind of having a survivor mentality early on and shifting over towards, Hey, what do I want? Like designing your life sort of, you know, and what do you want your life to be like? How did you figure that out? Did you know what you wanted already? Or did you have to like go through some type of process to figure out what you wanted your life to be like? And what is that? Um, my wife finally just said, is this what you want to do? Because I had a great career and I was building companies on the side. And then she just like stopped me. She doesn't have the same background and experience in entrepreneurship and all, you know, setting up all these companies. But she just really level set me and said, is that really what you want to do? And I was like, had I not heard that before? <laughs> or maybe I just, it was the right moment and the right time. And I think that changed everything. So we up and totally uprooted and moved to Miami from Chicago on the beach, living in a hotel full time. Like it was, I was like, the lifestyle was a big piece of what I was missing. I had no balance, you know, keep saying I'm a Libra and, you know, go back and forth on these scales. It was like run from one side to the other. And I think once I got a taste of having a little bit of balance in my life, it was a new business for me hmm. to, I became my own, you know, sculpting of what I wanted life right. to be like. And then I was like, what actually fits into that? And as I continued to do it and things got better I realized my businesses were more successful. People were happier around me. Like it was just an all around better solution. And I wish I would have done it sooner. And I think most people spend most of their life chasing to this point or pinnacle of success only to turn back around to fix everything they destroyed to get there. Mm. And I was in that camp, you know, not healthy, very unbalanced in terms of just work and no play, no time. 
didn't have time for friends or family. I just, that was a secondary thing in my life. Wasn't really, if I had a vacation, I sure as hell didn't enjoy it because I was working. Yeah. And so that's changed. And yeah. it's been really good for me and all of the things I'm doing, right? And and then it also changed what I wanted to build next. So, and I think this is also just being in a position where I can choose what I want versus like the scarcity mentality piece of my yeah. life. Thoughtful things that could impact others. And now I'm looking at what I've built and I'm like, these are things that I had problems with when I was younger. So like I'm going after building affordable housing. I'm trying to help small business owners with credit card processing issues. That's one of the companies that I built. So all of these things that I'm like looking back, I'm like, those are problems that I had when I was younger and wished I could have solved back then that I then I'm now trying to help other businesses and other people in the areas I had struggles with. So it's just a cool full circle that it, it actually has more purpose than just profit. Right. So that, that's what I was focused on before. It was like, I need to make money. I need to survive. I need to get out of here. And then that didn't end. It, yeah. Too mm -hmm. much was never enough. Like I could just, it was insatiable to continue to make more, 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 more. And I would spend it. Don't get me wrong. I <laughs> enjoyed spending it too, but I could have continued down that path forever. And then once it was more like, thinking through how I was going to spend my day. Was I going to be the operator who was stressed? You know, was I going to be a day trader? Like, you know, really stressed out trying to figure out the next move or was I going to try to build something with a residual income, something that was a bit more passive, something that was creative because I loved being creative. So as you see the businesses change, mm -hmm. like the last company was focused around design. I love design. I don't know why I'm not an artist. I don't have a background in it. I don't have a d degree in fine arts, but I could intelligently speak about and art direct senior level New York School of Design and RISD grads. And they were like, where did you go to school? Like, I didn't. I just had a knack for design. I loved it. Mm. And I turned it into a residual thing by creating a subscription-based design company. So it was, you can kind of see that I was trying to get to that point where it was passion and purpose and less impact and more freedom and availability to actually enjoy life. Sure. And so that, that has been a directional thing and it's just an on, it's, it's a forever thing now. So yeah. I've, I've been really focused on that in all of the most recent ventures. That's cool. It sounds like you almost taken like your values have changed a little bit or what you prioritize in life. And then you almost use that as a filter now to decide which companies you're going to work on. It's like, okay, like one of your requirements sound like it was like re residual income is nice, something that's creative. You're not operating it long-term um, and something that probably still allows you to spend time with your family and things like that. Yeah, and have cool experiences yeah. and meet great people. I mean, it's funny because I started, like, I think this is also how I met you guys. I started podcast guesting, if you will, when I had the design company so that I could promote the company. And then I recognized that it was just great meeting awesome people and networking and just building relationships and being able to actually touch certain communities and hopefully give some insight to what not to do or repeat of things that I did. And also just like the young entrepreneurial groups that I feel like I could just lend an ear to and help directionally. I don't, have a class or something to sell them. It was more, Hey, this is something that I feel like would be impactful to the business community to help them. And maybe along the way there's synergies between what they're doing and what I'm doing, or if there's connection points, but also just meeting great people along the way. So I continue to do it despite not really having anything to promote. Um, the company I built more recently, I didn't want to come on here and promote it because it's not something that needs to be promoted. And to be honest, if the banks and processors find out what I'm doing, they'll probably shut it down. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, so buy you out. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that one I won't sell. Um, this is <laughs> something that's a little bit more Robin Hood style, mm -hmm. uh, right. helping small business to recoup money from banks and processors without 
impacting their day to day. So that, that's cool. something that I built and it's like, I, I want to promote it so bad and it's a weird environment for me to be in. Mm-hmm. But it was, like I said, it was just like, I'll just continue to, you know, connect and network and meet great people. So, yeah. so that's part of what I wanted to do. So you said Design Co. Uh, was a subscription based. What, yes. do you, what do you think the difference is? Like, is it wording, language, retainer versus subscription? Is it like a retainer psychological thing? It, yeah, it is. I mean, I, I was trying to, well, first of all, I think that the most part of subscription-based design stuff is, you know, designers in India, Malaysia, like Philippines. they're making three, four, five bucks an hour. Some of them are amazing creatives. Yeah. They just don't have the creative background. Um, and maybe not the educational piece that takes something from like really, like really good, but to like, wow, this is, you know, game changing. So I tried to bring a really luxe version of that, you know, design pickle, if you will, Mm -hmm. type environment. And we build software to effectively manage the whole process because I'm a process person. I wanted to make it hyper efficient for the customer and also for the design team. And then I hired local us de- highly degreed senior only designers to actually execute the work mm. so it wasn't cost i mean it was it didn't it wasn't competitive in terms of price point but we were we got some amazing customers i mean we, yeah. we ended up picking up amazing companies but then i realized we're back to the same thing lifestyle i'm managing a huge team with a lot of people and a lot of moving parts on a daily basis there's a Herculean effort to continue growth. Not everybody needs to design consistently forever. Mm -hmm. So subscription was a weird thing because yeah, it was a retainer, but if you didn't use it, you lost it. That's the big difference between a retainer and a subscription. Yeah. yeah. You ended up getting a better design hour price point, you know, if they didn't spend enough time and, you know, inherently companies don't It's hurry up and wait. So they're like, Hey, design this. And then here, yeah, we okay, got to wait five weeks for approval. And then yeah. it's like, all right, well, balls in Which your court. We, hey, it actually expedited things. It was kind of a, it's such a unique thing to do. And then I met a, a really good operator. So I was like, Hey, I'm, you know, he, he had been involved in another company and bought one of my other companies previously. And I was like, he's a better operator. He's got a whole team. He, it's the right fit. And they had a growth engine. I was like, you plug your growth engine in and just keep going. Um, it's not for me. I want to continue to do design focused things. And I, I have some design focused businesses that I'm involved in now, but really it's, it's not graphic design. It's not, you know, executing stuff for, for companies like I used to. It's more like custom um, development of things in the payment space. Very unique. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, I think in general, that was like a, such a different approach to a traditional business. And it, it checked a lot of the boxes but then it didn't check the big one. How does it fit into your day-to-day vision of how you want to live every day? Yeah. What, how do you want to live every day? I guess that's the question. Do you have kids? <laughs> no kids, no plants, no pets. Okay. Um, we so like to you and your wife. Yeah. And we travel hard. I mean, we're, we, we really put some miles on and we love European summer. We love coming back here in the winter. We like Island hopping, so it was like, how am I going to do that and have to have a big office with a lot of people and, you know, you have to be the face of the company. Like it's not, I, you know, follow the leader is a real thing. I learned really early on that people are just going to do as much or less than you are. Right. So, and I put a lot of time and effort and energy into the companies to get them to a point. And so I think it's important that whatever I build, I start with an operator who can actually manage day one Hmm. so that there's somebody in place that's becomes the face. And I become less of the face and more of the, like, Hey, I got it set up. It was my, you know, ideation, creativity, um, get it to profitability, get the numbers dialed in the way I like to see them, which is profit first. And then I can let somebody take it and run with it. And, you know, hear that face of the company. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I hear it. I hear it. Yeah. Sure. No, yeah. I mean, I'm so I'm working on a subscription based web design company right now. And I've gone back and forth about some things like, you know, do I get somebody in there day one to run things? I mean, 
I'm still, I'm not where you're at with the experience that you have yet, but like in my future, I see like, okay, after this one, maybe I could be at the point where I could afford to hire an operator from the beginning. You know what I mean? And be like, okay, from the beginning, I could have this person run it, operate it and not need to do it all for myself. But I also hear what you're saying with like, you got to feel those cycles of pain <laughs> at the beginning. Cause it's like really helpful to be in touch with exactly what customers are saying exactly what's happening on every level you know so i go back and forth about that idea of bringing an operator from the beginning development is a lifestyle you know i think when people get into the development business like they're like i'm going to be a web developer and we're going to do web development i mean it's an ever-changing horribly rapidly changing growing environment with language changes and front-end coding changes yeah yeah it's like a constant evolving beast and you have to live it yeah so it's not something that you get to just like hands off build it and that's you know one of the discussions we had because we we owned a web development company original click was originally a web developer um and so we did e-commerce development we did some really great projects for huge companies but we were behind the scenes and it was like mechanical e-commerce development you know i'm a gentle and um we before WooCommerce was really a thing, OS Commerce. I mean, we were into some of the older platforms. And so when we were doing that, it was like really mechanical and very simple. And then it just, it, overnight, it's like a totally different thing. And then Shopify comes out and another. So I think the challenge with that for me and my lifestyle was I had to live it. I had to like be on the pulse consistently, 24 7 365 you can't unplug from it because the second you unplug you you lost like what used to be a year's worth of work you're like it's gone like somebody's leapfrog technology came out last night you gotta you really gotta stay on it so tech is great i love it i'll, I'll always be involved in it i'm more and more loving fintech because regulation slows it down yeah. significantly where web development's like it's a wide open throttle it's so hard to yeah. stay on that horse yeah. So it was one for me that I, we had a discussion about reviving that when design co came out I was like, no pure play design, no development too much. You know, it's too much work to maintain all of that in a single platform. Yeah. I think that's changed with the new leadership that they have, that they're doing all of the above with design and development and marketing and all in a single platform. And I think it's, it's awesome to have, it would be great to sole source, you know, that type of environment. Right. I wish I had that because I would have never built it. I would have just hired it done then yeah. so, I, so I could spin out an idea quickly. Right, for sure. Yeah. Cool. So then looking back, um, it sounds like you've spent many, many hours. I don't want to say wasted because I'm sure you've learned from, from all those things and all those things have brought you to where you are today and have kind of molded and shaped you. But I guess looking back and then – projecting into the future, what are the things that you maybe um, would warn people of? Like, like, did you ever want to have kids, but you're just too focused on your business and company? So you're like, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not going to have kids because I'm focused on business. And now you're like, oh, maybe it would have been nice if I had some kids that were 10, 15 years old right now. Yeah, I am not a proponent of, I mean, look, I think everybody's got to put in the work. Is no, there's no two ways about it. I, you got to grind out for a period of time. I think, and that's become less and less. Like I, yeah. See, nobody wants to work, gen- man. Nobody wants to I work. It's gener- ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, I have hey, so many I- friends too that are just like, you know, nothing. It's just like, oh, that would just take so much work. I'm like, yeah, that's that's the whole point. And then you can relax. But in the beginning, you gotta like make some sacrifices. I think it's just a weird. It's, it's a weird moment because there's going to be a point where all this like monotonous work is going to disappear. And they're like not a proponent of the robot business, but it's going to happen. Yeah. So I think some of that stuff will disappear, you know, dissipate. But then what's left, right, is you're going to have to be hyper intelligent and a developer of some sort in some language. But even that, like how long does that last before, you know, there's some overtake there? I mean, I didn't think AI to ever be able to design anything. It's happening. Mm hmm. I didn't think, I mean, co-pilot with development, come on, this is a game changer. Yeah. Like, developers got really efficient, really fast. And 
not to say that AI is not going to take over the whole thing, but it's learning. Yeah. And I think it's learning at a much more rapid pace than we do. So at some point, do I think it's going to be able to full on scale out and prototype and develop and launch a full scale application? Probably not in the short term, but can it build pieces of it faster than we can and, you know, debug and yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the debugging industry is going to have a massive problem mm-hmm. because that that's going to be automated quickly. I mean, I see it happening already. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird moment to say that I could look back and say, I did something wrong. I don't think I did anything wrong. It, it's what I needed for me, mm-hmm. but I would caution people to have some balance, like take a moment, take a knee, relax for a minute breathe, like enjoy the moment and not be like this rise and grind thing. I get it. You got to do it, but it Mm -hmm. shouldn't, we shouldn't glorify that to a degree. Right. I think that's just, you know, tell week, you got to get through that piece of it. And then Mm -hmm. on the other side of it is discipline and understanding and an appreciation for what it actually takes to get those things done. So it's, it's not that I did it wrong, but it's, I wish I would have did it a little bit more thoughtfully along the way. Yeah. Well, and you, you're still young guys. So you got a lot of road ahead of you, so you can make those tweaks. And, uh, but I'm glad that our audience could hear that. You know, there's a lot of young people who listen to our show and, and, uh, they can hear that, like, hey, I got to work hard, but then also don't forego the things that really have meaning and purpose and, um, relationship building, family, things like that. So I think that's awesome. Man, I feel like we could, talk for another hour we could uh, yeah uh so you got to start writing your book so that we can then have you back on and we could talk about the book and <laughs> the book of ideas that's yes, right book the ideas. book of yeah. ideas man um ben you got any takeaways for this episode i sure do um a couple of things i wrote down as you were talking jeremy things that stuck with me were every entrepreneur should go through the full cycle of pain i feel that one um it's easier to build something when the customers are ready. It's easier to raise capital if you're already profitable. Sometimes you just need to stop, ask yourself, is this really what I want to do? And start thinking about that yeah. balance. And finally, I didn't choose furniture. Furniture chose me. <laughs> uh, let's I'm gonna go. Steal that. <laughs> I want to. I'm gonna. That's gonna be my shirt. I'm gonna have a shirt that says that. <laughs> oh man, it's still. Good. Well, hey, thanks so much. And uh, I got one thing. We like to leave people with um, one tip of advice. Something that on Monday morning they can just wake up and they can start focusing on their business to make themselves better or their business better. What would that one thing you would recommend them do starting Monday morning? There's no magic pill. There's absolutely no one size fits all magic pill for this. So don't go out and seek out that magic pill because everybody's selling. Right. Oh, yeah. The gurus, the courses, the, you know, all the shiny objects. I I don't know how how many people I know that have wasted so much money on all these things. I'm like, dude, if you just start working, I think you would have some success. (laughs) Not to say you shouldn't have mentorship. I think you should seek out mentorship. I just... People that say there's a there's a shortcut and I have the secret recipe and mm-hmm. you just plug this key in and it's eleven hundred dollars a month. That's the <laughs> wrong. It's the that, that doesn't exist. <laughs> Good to know. All right, hey, go to the FridayHabit.com. There you can find show notes for this episode. You can also find links to our websites and ways to get in touch. And at the bottom of the page, you can download our guide to the Friday Habit System that will show you how to set aside one full day each week dedicated to working on your business instead of always in your business. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. And if you have a question for us or a guest you'd like us to interview, send us an email to hello at the Friday Habit back home. That's right. And until next time, remember, live every day like it's Friday. <laughs>